My name is Frank Hiley, and I'm going to be giving you a presentation about my scientific model of consciousness and the human brain, which uh, explains spirituality and spiritual enlightenment. And this is a completely scientific theory. It's consistent with all the laws of science, and it has no spirits in this explanation of spirituality. Now, in order to explain spirituality, I first have to define spirituality, and I have an equation for that. Spirituality equals religion minus dogma. So if a religion says that this book here is the truth and you've got to believe every word of this book, that's an example of dogma. Subtract that away from the religion and see what's left. That would be the spirituality. Both spirituality and religion cultivates a number of positive values such as love and forgiveness. And spirituality uses practices like prayer and meditation to achieve its goals. So my hypothesis is that spirituality developed between 40 and 100,000 years ago when human consciousness changed. Now, the reason for those particular dates is that 100,000 years ago is when humans started to intentionally bury their dead, and 40,000 years ago is where we started to make carvings that could represent a fertility goddess, for example. So that's the evidence that there might be some spirituality or religion going on at that time. Now, this change in consciousness was facilitated by the development of modern language. And my model is that the language vocabulary would have gradually increased with time. Our, our, the last common ancestor with the great apes was about six million years ago. And the chimpanzees in the wild right now have something like 30 or maybe 100 call signs. And that's vocal call signs and also gestures. They use both of those to, to signal each other. So probably six million years ago, we had 30 to 100 words. And oh, gradually over time, we added more and more words to it. And there must have been some genetic changes that made it much easier for us to invent and remember words and understand what they mean. And gradually over time, we added more and more vocabulary. We learned how to, to start fires and make tools and all that kind of stuff. And then around 40 to 100,000 years ago is where we crossed some kind of a threshold and kind of into the, moder the modern vocabulary range. And that's when spirituality developed. However, language is really only the IO mechanism for the true cause of this change in consciousness which is the development of conceptual worlds. And it started out with a conceptual model of the real world. You know, we would have words for all the objects in our world, and we could talk about the objects that way. But it then became a purely conceptual world as we invented more and more abstract concepts. <clears throat> so abstract concepts don't correspond to something out in the physical world. And that's, that's what, that's what uh, caused this development of spirituality. And this conceptual world changed who we are. Ancient humans would have identified with the body. That's who I am, is that body. And modern humans identify with the conceptual self, the I, me, my. That's the autobiographical narrative me. That's who I am. Now, this conceptual world did a lot of wonderful things, like it allowed humans to populate the entire Earth, and it gave us science and technology and everything we see around us here. But it's not good for living a happy life. That's the problem that the conceptual self in particular caused. And spirituality is the cure for that problem. Now on to a new topic, world models and agents. The definition of an agent is an agent is an entity that has goals, has a way of sensing the world, and has a way of making changes to the world to try to achieve those goals. By that definition, human beings like me are agents. I can sense the world, I can change the world, and I have goals in the world. Now, a control system theorem from 1970 states that every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. Now, a regulator here is an agent, and the system is the, is the world that the agent is trying to make changes in. And so this would say that every good agent needs a model of the world. So my human being here must have a model of the world where I got a kind of a one-to-one -one mapping between what's out there in the world and my model of the world here inside my brain. Now, a human being has a body, which is also part of the world, and so I have to also have a model of my body, and I call that the self-model. It's the self-model of, of the human. If the agent is part of the world that it's, that it's cha making changes in, it will need to have a self-model to model itself in that world. Now, the question is, do we live in the world directly, or do we live in our model of the world? Are we self-models living in a model of the world? If you look at the, the body, that doesn't help you because the body and the world is the same as the model of the body and the model of the world. They're basically equivalent. So that won't answer this question.
However, the conceptual self, the I, me, my, that only exists in my conceptual model of the world. There is no physical object out there in the world that corresponds to that concept. So that would say that we are human self-models living in a model of the world. That might not convince you, so let me ask you a different question. Do we experience the world directly, or are we self-models experiencing our model of the world? Colors can help answer that question. The way colors work is that there are three kinds of photoreceptors in the retina that take essentially three black and white images in red, green, and blue, and that's the information that's sent to the brain. So the brain takes those three black and white images and constructs this. The colors that you see there do not exist out in the world. They only exist in our model of the world. The, the red, there is no such property as fo a redness that comes on that red photon that's coming in from the red there. There's no, there's no physical property of redness there. So this is constructed by our brain to help us live better in this world. <clears throat> Furthermore, what we experience is not what we perceive. And in the visual realm, I'm talking about perception as being the information that the eye sends to the brain. That's our perception of the world. But that's not what we experience. And the reason for that is that peripheral visual acuity drops very rapidly with, with angle. So if you have 20-20 vision in the center of vision here, if you go off to the axis here, the, vision, the, the acuity drops off dramatically. And out here, you're, you're legally blind. And on addition, in addition to that, there's a blind spot where you don't see anything at all in each eye. And you can show that yourself here by looking at my face. And hopefully, you can see my eyes, my ears, my, my mouth. And if you have good acuity, you might be able to actually see my glasses. And now if you look off 45 degrees away from me and try to use your peripheral visual attention to see what my face looks like, I bet you just see a blob. You don't actually see eyes, nose, mouth, or anything like that. That shows how much the visual acuity has dropped off with angle. And yet, when we look out at the world, we experience something like this. So if you keep your center of vision on that center house there, all the other houses still look like they're crisp and in focus. And in fact, if you go beyond the screen, things look like they're crisp and in focus. Your experience of them is that they are crisp and in focus, even though your eye is telling you a blurry image there. So what the eye is sending to the brain is something more like this. And in addition, there's the blind spot. Now, you might say we don't see the blind spot because it's in different positions in the two eyes. But if you close one eye, you still don't see the blind spot. The blind spot is completely invisible. And the reason for all this is that what we experience is the world model that we've constructed in our brain. We are experiencing the world model as we live our world life here. Another example of this is rapid eye saccades. A saccade is where your, your eyes have one focus point and they're gonna go to another focus point and they rapidly move from one to the other. It turns out that during that rapid motion there, the brain actually shuts off all visual perception. You're actually blind during the period of time when the, when the, when the eyes are moving. And you can demonstrate this at home if you stand in front of your bathroom mirror and change your fixation point from your left eye to your right eye to your left eye. What you'll see is completely stationary eyes. You'll never catch the eye moving if you do that. So that's showing you that the, during that time the eye is moving, you're blind. And yet, the, the big thing is, why does the world not shift when you're moving your eye like that? Because the image that's coming in on the retina is completely different when you shift your fixation point to a different point. Why doesn't the world seem to jump when you do that? The reason why the world doesn't jump is because you are perceiving your model of the world. You are not perceiving the actual world that's coming in through your eyes. So this shows you all that perception is not what we're seeing. And what we see is the model of the world. So the bottom line is that we are a self-model living in and experiencing our model of the world. That's what human beings are. Now I'm going to explain my three-agent model of the human brain. And the first agent is the thinker. And the thinker is the general problem solver. The doer is the agent that controls the body and also has feelings and emotions. And the experiencer is the agent that creates the model of the world that's required by the good regulator theorem. Now the evidence for the thinker and doer is that they are consistent with well-established, experimentally derived models of cognition in two different fields. In the field of psychology, there's dual process theory. And the way that psychologists demonstrate this dual process theory is by looking for question where the intuitive answer is the wrong answer. And people who are using their doer to answer that question will just take the easy answer, which is the intuitive answer, and give the wrong answer to the question. People who use the thinker to actually think about the problem 
will give the correct answer by thinking about what the, what the correct answer is. And a, a lot of these things had to do with probability. The, it turns out we have lousy intuitions when it comes to probability. We often think the wrong answer is true when we're just using an intuitive thought. That's why casinos are so successful. Now, in the field of neuroscience, there's a model that's called the action outcome stimulus response model. An action outcome refers to the fact that you're trying to achieve a given outcome, and you're trying to figure out what action will get you that outcome. That's problem solving. That's trying to solve the problem of getting that outcome and figuring out what action will do it. So that's the thinker. The stimulus response is the doer. Now, given a thinker and a doer, the experiencer is required by the good regulator theorem. And a, a model of the major connections between the agents is shown here. The thinker is the general problem solver. And in addition to solving problems, the thinker can also produce thoughtful speech. For example, when you're reporting the result of the sum of two two-digit numbers, your thinker computed those results, and then your thinker is using thoughtful speech to communicate the answer to somebody else. The doer controls the body, and it also has feelings and emotions. And the doer is the agent that produces automatic speech. And it turns out that most of our speech is automatic. If you're not aware of the next word that's going to come out of your mouth during the time that you're saying it, that's automatic speech. And the, the experiencer and the doer together are very capable of having a long conversation purely with automatic speech. Then the experiencer is the agent that, that creates the conceptual and the sensory model of the world. And the, this, this model of the world has to include the body, because my body is part of the world. And in addition, it contains the goals of all the agents, and it contains the self-models of the four agents. Now, there's three agents shown in this diagram, but the human brain as a whole is an agent. So there's a, there's a self-model for the human as a whole, and then the self-model for each of these three sub-agents. And the way that the experiencer builds up this conceptual and sensory model of the world is by understanding its inputs. So in the sensory realm, if I understand the sensory input that's coming in, I can update my model of the world uh, with that sensory input in mind. And similarly, when I'm updating my conceptual model of the world by listening to language for, coming from other people and taking the information they've given me there, there and update my conceptual model of the world with what they've told me. Now, if you don't understand it, then you say you don't understand what somebody's saying and that you have to either ask them or maybe use your thinker to try to figure out what they say and try to figure out a way of making that fit into your model of the world. Similarly, in the, sensual, in the sensory area, magicians confound us constantly there because they do things that we don't understand. How in the world can that bird disappear out of nothing? That's an example of not understanding the input. The other thing that the experiencer understands is intuition. My definition of intuition is that intuition is understanding how the world works without thinking. So if you're not, you don't have to involve your thinker and you just intuitively know how the world works, that's intuition coming from the experiencer. One thing the experiencer doesn't understand is instincts. The doer is the agent that understands instincts. And my definition of instincts is that instincts is understanding what to do in the world without thinking. And the doer is the one that does things, so he understands instincts. Now here are some other connections between the three agents. There's two kinds of attention. There's top-down attention. And this is where the thinker or the doer are telling the experiencer, pay attention to that object. For example, in meditation, trying to pay attention to your breath, that's, that's where the thinker is telling the experiencer to pay attention to the breath. Bottom-up attention is where the experiencer chooses the object that's going to be attended to. And it might be that it's a novel object that was unexpected, something happened that it didn't expect. So it will bring that to the attention of the thinker and doer in case they have to do something about that. The other example is that if, for example, I have a goal of eating ice cream, if my doer has a goal of eating ice cream, and somebody puts some ice cream down near me, the experiencer is going to say, hey, there's ice cream there. And then my doer can go and pick it up and eat it. So that's bottom-up attention. Now, the experiencer also experiences the internal voice and visualizations of the thinker. The thinker generates the internal voice that we hear in our head or the visualizations. Some people are more visual. Some people are more verbal. But whatever it is, visual or verbal, it's the thinker that's generating that, and we can experience that with the experiencer. Similarly, the experiencer experiences the emotions and feelings of the doer. So the doer generates the emotions, and the experiencer is the agent that experiences those. Now, in addition, the doer needs to tell the experiencer about any planned motions of the body. Because if we move our body, the sensory inputs are going to change. 
and the experiencer has to know how they're going to change so that it doesn't think something weird is happening. Now, the source of goals for the three agents starts with evolution, and the, the, the evolutionary goal for the thinker is just to solve problems. Now, the evolutionary goals for the doer are many. They, the three major categories of, of goals for the doer are survive, reproduce, and be social. We're very social animals, as you can demonstrate by this gathering here. And so the, the doer has those three major goals. There's lots of minor goals associated with that, like get water, get food, get shelter, things like that. So those are the three major categories. Now, why is there only one goal for the thinker? It's because the thinker has been designed by evolution to handle the cases that the doer can't handle. So if, if the environment is changing too rapidly, the doer might not have the instinctual ways of handling the, the new environment. And the thinker can come in and think about it and solve the problem of how to achieve those goals that the doer has in, in this new environment. And then finally, the experiencer has the goal of creating the model of the world and also directing attention as required. Now, agents can also create new goals. For example, my thinker creates a lot of conceptual goals for me. One of my conceptual goals is to always be right. And another goal that my thinker created was, in high school, I decided I wanted to become a physicist. Now, to, create a, to, to, to achieve that goal of becoming a physicist, you have to create a lot of small sub-goals sub for that, like going to MIT, going to Stanford, you know, doing all the classes that I needed to do to, 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 get the, um, to achieve the goal of getting that PhD in physics. And the other way that, that goals are created is by copying them. The doer's goals of survive, reproducing, and being social can be copied into the thinker, and the thinker will then adopt those goals. The doer can also copy that goal of always being right, and when somebody tells me that I'm wrong, it can get angry. So that's, that's the way that the goals are created for the three different agents. Now I'm going to talk about the self-models for the agents. And since the thinker mostly works in the conceptual realm, the thinker is the I, me, my concept. That's who I am. Now, the doer is mostly working in the sensory realm, and it controls the body. So the, the doer's self-model is the body itself. And finally, the experiencer doesn't do anything in that world out there. So it, you might think it doesn't need a self-model, but it does, and I'll explain that later. And finally, the human as an agent will have some combination of the self-models of the three agents shown above. So the human agent will be some combination of these three self-models. Now I'm going to turn to an explanation of ordinary spirituality. And by ordinary, I mean spirituality that does not include spiritual enlightenment. I'll talk about enlightenment later. As I said previously, spirituality fixes a problem. And the problem that spirituality solves is the thinker. You know, the thinker is great for science and technology and, 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 and all of that, but it's not good at living a happy life. And the problem is, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. To a problem solver, everything looks like a problem. So that leads to a negative critical attitude towards life. You know, here's a problem, there's a problem. And if I can't find a problem right here and right now, then I have to find a problem. I have to go out and find a problem, because that's the problem if I can't find a problem. So I will go looking into the past for a problem to solve in the past, and that's usually a resentment of some kind. I've got to solve that resentment problem. Or I'll go, I'll go off into the future and try to solve some future problem that often results in fear if I don't think I've come up with a perfect solution to that future problem. The thinker also argues with reality. It says, this shouldn't have happened. Why did, you know, why did that happen? And um, oh, about the past and the future, the, the, the thinker is always rehashing and rehearsing, is the way I've heard someone say it. He's rehash, rehash, rehashing the past and rehearsing the future. In other words, the thinker is having conversations with people who are not in the room. <laughs> and like I said, the, the experiencer argues with reality. And negative emotions are a problem for the thinker. How, how, how do I make sure that this thing doesn't happen again, the thing that caused this negative emotion? That's a problem. Positive emotions are also a problem. How do I make sure this happens all the time? In fact, the thinker can turn a positive emotion into a negative emotion of fear of what happens when this goes away. I'm going I'm to be unhappy. Now, the cause of the problem is that the modern non-spiritual human completely identifies with the thinker. That's who I am. And the, the reason, and this, this has some consequences. If I'm identifying with a the thinker, then the thinker's goals are the most important goals. And that thinker inner voice that I have in my head, that's me. That's who's talking. I, I've got to pay attention to that. And the reason that the experiencer sets the thinker as being the self-model of the human 
is that the, the thinker is literally shouting, we are I, me, my. That's who we are. We're I, me, my. Now, the, the doer might be whispering, we're the body, but the experiencer hears the thinker's shouts and sets the, the, the modern human to equal the thinker-self model. Now, with some spiritual practices like prayer and meditation, you could get a, a human self-model which is more balanced and has the, both the experiencer and doer mixed in with the thinker. And in fact, for the, the theistic spiritual paths, the experiencer would be the feeling of a connection to God. A lot of the theistic paths talk about having God's will for us comes through intuition. That intuitive thought, that's God's will for us. That intuitive thought comes from the experiencer. So I'll be identifying the experiencer with God in, throughout this, this talk here. So, so now that the doer is included there, the doer goals are now more important. So the doer's pro-social goals are more important. And finally, the thinker takes all the credit for living life, and the doer and experiencer do most of the work. So the thinker thinks he does everything, but he really doesn't. Now, if you look at a list of spiritual virtues and spiritual vices, all of the spiritual virtues make social situations go more smoothly. On the other hand, the thinker self-model, I, me, my, is, is kind of the definition of selfishness and self-centeredness. It's all about me. And if you look at the spiritual vices, those are all selfish and self-centered goals. The, the, those are all things that make social situations go with more friction. Having the doer involved in the, in the self-model of the human is important because that makes it, makes it more likely that we'll practice the spiritual virtues rather than the spiritual vices. Now let's take a look at some common spiritual practices. Meditation is an attempt to kind of quiet down the thinker and, and to experience life from the experiencer point of view. Surrender would be the thinker admitting that it's powerless and that it can't really control the whole world the way it thinks it does and asking for help from the doer and the experiencer. And prayer is the way that it asks for help from that experiencer. Living in the now is what the experiencer and doer do all the time, whereas the thinker is off living in the past or living in the future. Forgiveness is a way to ameliorate the resentments that, we, that are caused by the thinker trying to solve pro problems in the past. And my favorite saying for, about forgiveness is that forgiveness is giving up all hope of a better past. As long as I'm trying to make that past be better, I'm just going to hold on to that resentment. And then acceptance is, is what the experiencer does always. It doesn't say I refuse to accept that sensory input. It accepts all sensory inputs no matter what they are. The Krishnamurti was asked, what's the secret to enlightenment? And he said, you see, I don't mind what happens. That's the acceptance. That's what the experiencer does. Trusting would be trusting a higher power that everything's going to work out okay. That can ameliorate the fears caused by the thinker trying to solve problems in the future. And then gratitude is an antidote for the negative critical attitude of, towards life that the thinker has by trying to solve all the problems here in the present. Now, how can the experiencer help with other problems? I posit that there's a wise intuitive attention mechanism that can help a human in general. And in particular, I'm going to talk about alcoholism and AA recovery. My model is that alcoholism starts with the thinker. The thinker takes that first drink and he thinks, boy, I feel really good when I do this. I've got to drink more often. So he creates a goal of drinking more often, and he, and he, and he satisfies that goal as often as he can. The doer also copies that goal. And so now, even if the thinker is thinking, no, I'm not going to drink today, somebody puts a drink down right next to him, he'll pick it up and drink it without even thinking about it. So those, those goals get stronger and stronger because, you know, I do feel better when I drink. But eventually, the negative consequences of all this drinking begin to catch up with the thinker. He begins to notice that there's negative consequences. And so he comes up with another goal of not drinking. But the goal of not drinking now has to fight against two very strong goals in the thinker of drinking and the doer, of the, the goal of drinking. So in AA, the recovery starts when the thinker surrenders. The thinker admits, I'm powerless over alcohol. I'm trying to stop drinking, but I can't. I need help. And when it asks the experiencer for help, and that comes in the third step of the 12-step program, where we turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, that's the, the thinker asking for help from the experiencer. Now, when this happens, the experiencer notices that the thinker has these two contradictory goals, one of not drinking and one of drinking, and that here's the, the thinker say that I can't solve this problem on my own, but I want to help with it. So the experiencer uses wise intuition to realize that 
if the experiencer paid less attention to alcohol, that could help the thinker meet his goal of not drinking. So one thing that would happen is that if there's some alcoholic drink in the environment, don't bring it to the attention of the doer so that the doer does the automatic drinking of it. The other thing that can help is when the thinker starts to obsess about drinking. You know, he, he wants to not drink, but he keeps obsessing about drinking. You know, oh, my wife criticized me. I should go out and take a drink or whatever. He has any reason. Any reason is a reason to take a drink. When that obsess, uh, obsessive thought comes along, the experiencer can pay less attention to that obsessive thought. And things that are not paid attention to will dissipate more quickly. So those obsessive thoughts can go away. And you can stick to the goal of not drinking. So this same mechanism can work in other cases where we're suffering. And in fact, Buddhism talks about that humans suffer because of attachments and aversions. So if we can decrease the, the strength of our attachment to the, our positive things or the aversion of the negative things, then that could also help with the suffering that humans have from the attachments and aversions in general. Now let's look at attention schema theory. And the first thing you might ask is, what's an attention schema? So I'll start with some definitions. A body schema is a model of the body. So there's the physical body, but then there's the mental mo model of the body that the, that the brain has. And this mental model of the body has information about the angles of all the limbs and the, the position of the body in the world, things like that. Similarly, the attention schema is a model of our current state of attention. Now there's an underlying neurological mechanism that pays attention, whatever it is, neurons firing. The attention schema is not that mechanism. The attention schema is a model of what that mechanism is doing. And there's a lot of potential targets for attention. For example, all five of the senses can be fences, all five of the senses can be a target for the attention. And feelings and emotions can be a target, or the inner voice of the thinker can be a target. And you know, you can imagine things happening, those are all targets of attention. So the attention schema will, will be a model of where attention is being paid by, by the human. Now let's look at the effect of attention on world models. So the idea is there's a real world out there that doesn't have colors in it, but then there's the world model you see here that has colors in it. Okay, so if you keep your eye on that center house there and use your peripheral attention to shift around, does the world change? No. Does the world model change? I don't think so. Let's try it. So keep your, vi your center of vision on that center house and then direct attention to that house on the right, direct attention to that house on the left, and then back to the center only. Did the world model change? No, it always, it always looks like the world itself is out there. What changes is that when you paid attention to something, you can see more information about that object. You can see more details. When you're paying attention to the house on the right there, you could see more details about the, the windows and the doors and the colors, and the same for the house on the left. So there is a, what I'm calling the current representation of the world, which contains that extra information. So there's the model of the world, which, which doesn't change, but the current representation of the world has extra information in it when you pay attention. So if this is the current representation of the world, you see the house in the center there has, has got, is clearer and has more uh, information available. And when you shift per peripheral attention to the right, that's clearer, per shift it to the left, that's clearer, and back to the center. Now notice that the current representation of the world, the CRW, changes when attention is being directed around. Now the experiencer is, is modifying that internal model of the world by directing attention. So this is where the experiencer has a self-model. It has a self-model in this internal model of the world, the current representation of the world. And it's the attention schema, which is the model of the experiencer. So let's look at the three objects we've been talking about here. We've got the world model, we've got the attention schema, and we've got the current representation of the world. I claim that if you have any two of these, you can compute what the third one should look like. For example, if you have these, you know where to put the spotlight of attention to get the current representation of the world. If you have these two, you can subtract them and see where the attention schema must be pointing. And finally, if you have these two, you can, you can create a function which will give you the world model as a function of the attention schema combined with the current representation of the world. So my claim here is that the, the information content of the world model is equal to the information content of the attention schema combined with the current representation of the world. Now let's add this information to the agent self models because we've now established that the experiencer self model is in fact the attention schema. That's the model of how the experiencer changes that internal model of the world by directing attention around and the model of that attention is exactly the attention schema. Now I'm gonna to turn to attention schema theory 
And attention schema theory was proposed by a Princeton neuroscientist named, named Michael Graziano to explain awareness. It's a model of awareness, what it means to be aware of something, the, the, to have that conscious experience of something. And everything I'm going to present on this slide and on the next slide is from the paper by Graziano and Webb that's referenced at the bottom of the screen here. And in fact, everything here is from figure, a, figure 1A and figure 1B on that paper. And that figure 1A and B has a very long caption under, underneath it. I've summarized that caption in the text on these two slides. So all the text here is really from Graziano. The only thing I've done is modify his notation to use my notation. So first of all, when visual attention is captured by an apple, that changes the current representation of the world. There's now more information available about that apple in that current representation of the world in the brain there. That is not awareness. That is only information. All that is is new, new information coming to the brain. To get actual awareness, you need two additional models. You need the self-model of the human, and you need the attention schema. And the idea here is that the attention schema is what links the self-model of the human to the object that you're aware of. So self-model, attention schema pointing to the object that you're aware of. In an equation, it would be that the overall model, overall model of awareness is self-model plus attention schema plus CRW. Now, attention schema th theory implies that only the experiencer is conscious. If you imagine you put the thinker and the doer and the experiencer into three separate brains instead of all being in one brain, it's only the brain that has the experiencer in it that has the attention schema and has the representation of the world. The thinker and doer don't have that. So it's only the experiencer that's conscious. Now, I'm going to talk about thinker consciousness and doer consciousness later. Whenever I'm talking about that, it's the thinker combined with the experiencer that gives you thinker consciousness, and it's the doer combined with the experiencer that gives you doer consciousness. But the only agent that's conscious all by itself is the experiencer. So now I'm going to talk about agent awareness models. And, and I'm going to start with the thinker. So if there's an actual attention mechanism in the brain that's pointing to this apple here, that changes the current representation of the world to include a lot of extra information about that apple. At the same time, the attention schema is pointing to that apple, and it's pointing to it from the self-model of the thinker, the I, me, my. So this is the model of awareness for the thinker. And the thinker might express this awareness in a sentence like, I, me, my, am aware of the apple. So that's the, the expressing it in words, is that I'm aware of the apple. Now for the, for the doer, the self-model is the body. And for the doer, the, it might be doing this in a sensory representation, in, in a feeling. So it's the feeling that the body is aware of the apple. So this is kind of the qualia, you know, like the, the, the awareness of the red in the apple there. That's the feeling of red that we're having in that apple there, that, that experience of, of red in the apple is the qualia of red. Now, the, the, for the experiencer, the self-model is the attention schema. But an attention schema pointing out an attention schema is equivalent to just attention schema. There isn't any self here. So the experiencer is an example of selfless awareness. I'm aware of the world without being aware of a self that's, that's aware of the world. And in, 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 in feelings that would be represented as aware apple. It's not I'm aware of apple or my body's aware of apple. It's just awareness of apple is all that it is. Now, if you look at the, the information that you have here, you have the attention schema and the current representation of the world. By the world model equation, that has exactly the same information content as the world model. So the other way of experiencing this, uh, this, this selfless awareness is as if I'm just the world model itself. So the experience of aware apple is essentially just awareness of the world. So we can summarize the three agent self models in this table here. And notice that wherever, wherever the attention schema is, that's where the word awareness is. So the attention schema is essentially another word for awareness. Now remember, the attention schema was the self-model of, of the experiencer. So if we go back to that table there, we can now substitute awareness. So think about that. Every time that you are aware of something in the world out here, you are experiencing your experiencer's self-model. Isn't that an amazing thought? you're actually experiencing that self-model of, of the experiencer whenever you're aware of something. And now we can say that the human will be some combination of those three self-models for the three different agents. Now returning to the awareness model table, we can convert this into a, a consciousness table of making the thinker, doer, and experiencer conscious. 
So the thinker consciousness would say in words, I'm aware of X. The doer consciousness would have body aware X, that feeling of being aware of X. And the experiencer would be aware X with no self or world model. Now let's look at agent self-awareness models when you're actually paying attention to yourself. And I'll start with a thinker, which is the I, me, my. So if you're paying attention to yourself here, you got that attention scheme of pointing from yourself back to yourself. And the experiencer would, would, would express this by saying, I am aware of me. Now for the doer, the self-model is the body. And so the doer would have the feeling, body aware of body. For the experiencer, the self-model is the attention schema. When you add the loop there, you end up with one big loop of attention schema pointing to itself. Now think about this. This is very unusual. You have a completely abstract concept here, which is now just pointing to itself. It's not pointing to anything else in the, in the conceptual world. You know, most concepts are, have a dense web of connections to other concepts in the, in the conceptual world. But you've got a self-model here. Uh, an aware, you have an abstract concept here, which exists all on its own. It definitely exists. Every time you pay, try to direct your attention to it, you see that it exists. And yet it does not have a location in space. There's no location in space associated with this. So maybe this is what religions are talking about when they talk about the soul, the human soul, is this loop of, of attention schema. It's a, it's a loop of awareness of awareness. Now, how would that feel? You have something that definitely exists but has no location. I think the word that comes to mind would be presence. There's a presence here from that loop of attention schema. And the other way of expressing that is that I'm aware of awareness. It gives you that presence. A lot of people would also express this as stillness because the thinker and doer self-awareness models can still think and do things. But the experiencer doesn't do anything except direct attention. And when attention is directed only to itself, there, it's not even directing attention to different objects. So this has stillness. Now, now let's take a look at being aware of an object and being aware of your awareness of that object. So here, the actual attention is directed to an object, and it's directed to our awareness of that object. This would end up giving you a loop of attention schema with a, with a branch off to the object that you're aware of. So the feeling of this would be something like presence awareness, because it's the awareness of the object that I'm, that I'm paying attention to and presence with that loop. Okay, let's take a look at spiritual enlightenment. First of all, what is enlightenment? Enlightenment is not about perfection in any way. Everything I'm talking about here is from Daniel Ingram's book, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. He has a chapter where he looks at 31 different models for enlightenment, and a lot of them about, are about perfection, perfect, perfect action, perfect thought, perfect speech, and he rejects all those. The only model he doesn't reject is the non-duality model. Now, non-duality is an English translation of a Sanskrit word, Advaita. Advaita literally means not to. There's only the world, basically. That's what non-duality means. And he also states that if you look at all the different lineages of Buddhism, there are anywhere from two to more than a dozen different named states of enlightenment. So there isn't just one final destination that everybody agrees on. And the trainings in Buddhism, this is, this is about the Vipassana tra tradition, which is the one that's very popular in the Americas. Training in morality is the first training, and this is essentially ordinary spirituality. This is tr trying to do the spiritual virtues and, the, and avoid the spiritual vices. Then there's training and concentration. This is where you're trying to do your meditative attention to uh, whatever your meditation object is. Then there's the insight that you get from all of this. And you can get enlightenment at any point here, but the, it, when enlightenment happens, you still have to do more training in morality. You're not perfect just because you're enlightened. You still have to work on the spiritual virtues and avoiding the spiritual vices. The first insight is impermanence. It knows that everything arises and falls and the objects aren't permanent, they disappear. And that suffering comes from attachments and aversions. If you're attached to an object that's impermanent, you're going to be unhappy when that object goes away. And finally, there's the, the non-dual uh, insight, which is the no-self insight. If, if, every, if every sense of a self that I have is really an illusion, that would say that there is no self and that the world and I are one. Now let's examine the Hindu Advaita Vedanta tradition. There's a lot of parts to this because this is a very elaborate philosophy of life and, and religious practice, but the main insight they have is non-duality. And that be, can be expressed in a couple of ways. One way is they say that Atman equals Brahman. Atman is supposed to be the true self or the soul of the human, and Brahman is reality. 
So again, it's this non-duality. This is saying my true self is equal to the entire world. The other way that could be expressed is that there's no subject-object distinction. Now, uh, the Indian Hindu sage Ramana Maharishi emphasized the self-inquiry as being the fastest way to enlightenment. And there's a lot of, of non-dual teachers here in the West that have, have latched onto that and talk about this, this self-inquiry method. And you ask, who am I? Well, I'm not the ego, I'm not the thinker, I'm not the body, I'm not the doer. And the answer given by one author is presence awareness. His name is John Wheeler, and his book is the answer to this question. And it says, presence awareness, just this and nothing else. That's the answer to who I am. And that can also be said as stillness. So again, we, we know that with ordinary spirituality, you can change from being a thinker only to including the experience and doer. With more spiritual practices, the experience would rise to the top of those three. And then the fully spiritually enlightened would be where I identify with the experiencer only. So if we put labels on these, on, on this axis here, there's the thinker, which is entirely the human self model, that's the thinker, the experiencer consciousness, which is the only the experiencer consciousness, and animals and ancient humans would have had a doer consciousness. So if you create a triangle of those three states, there are many paths from the thinker consciousness to the experiencer consciousness. So there isn't just one straight line that's the only way to get there. Now let's see if the experiencer consciousness correctly describes the enlightenment instincts. Experience awareness is selfless, and therefore that satisfies it for the no-self model. The experience or awareness model is equal to the world model. Again, for Atman equals Brahman, check mark for the experience or consciousness. Experience awareness has no subject-object distinction. Being aware of, of awareness is experienced as presence awareness by the experiencer, but not by the thinker or doer. And finally, stillness is experienced in that state. So my conclusion is the experience or consciousness state is the enlightened state that these traditions are talking about. That's what they're getting to with their spiritual practices. So I'd like to thank you for your directing your top-down attention to my presentation. And I hope that your experiencer intuitively understood how this three-agent model of consciousness explains spirituality. And I'm welcoming any questions. And also, go to my website and sign up for updates. You'll be notified if I have new videos available. And the most important thing is you'll be notified when I finally publish the book. <laughs> so are there any questions? I'm over time. I don't know if you want to do questions or you can come talk to me afterwards.